We'll start with a breakdown of Israel's recent elections. Earlier this month, Israelis turned out in near record numbers at the polls for their fifth election in less than four years. For a deeper dive on the Israeli election results, we turn to our man in Jerusalem, Cameron Brown. On November 1st, Israel held its fifth election in three and a half years. As Israel turned 75, this election demonstrated once more that Israel's vibrant democracy is alive and well. There had been concern about voter fatigue leading to low turnout, but in the end, the opposite proved true, as the election saw the second highest turnout since 1999, over 71%. Like the previous four elections, the biggest dividing line was whether voters supported former Prime Minister Netanyahu or were against him. And on that question, the vote shows a remarkably divided country and it split down the middle almost 50-50. However, two small parties didn't get enough votes to qualify for the Knesset, Israel's parliament. And with those parties out, Netanyahu and his partners ended the election with a solid majority, holding 64 out of 120 seats in the Knesset. The incoming coalition parties campaigned on a common agenda. Support for Netanyahu, reforming the judicial system, reducing the cost of living, and taking a hard line on fighting terrorism and working to increase personal safety. The parties in this future coalition, they share a similar view on the settlements and the role of religion in state. While it's safe to assume that there are going to be reforms in these areas, exactly how substantial reforms are going to be, that remains one of the key questions that the coalition negotiations are going to focus on now. For now, the leading politicians in this new coalition have to haggle among themselves who will lead each ministry and who will take key Knesset chairs. Thanks, Cameron. Here at APAC, we congratulate the people of Israel for continuing to demonstrate their commitment to democracy and free and fair elections. We look forward to working with the U.S. administration and Democrats and Republicans in Congress to continue strengthening the relationship between America and Israel. Up next, we turn to the midterms here at home. With control of both chambers of Congress up for grabs this cycle, we saw some surprising results and were once again reminded of the importance of building bipartisan support for Israel. In the last two years, we at APAC have met with hundreds of candidates running for Congress. We also worked with all of you to help elect pro-Israel Democrats and Republicans. Joining us to give a breakdown of the key races and trends that shaped the midterms is Ariel Schwartz. We now know that the Democrats will maintain control of the Senate and Republicans will take over the leadership of the House. For us, the most important takeaway from this election is that once again, high turnover and volatility were the defining trends of this cycle. This was the ninth straight election that saw at least 50 new members of Congress elected. And if results hold, this will be the 10th of the last 12, where control of at least one chamber of Congress or the White House changed hands. These sweeping changes underscore our commitment to pursuing bipartisanship. By building relationships on both sides of the aisle, we are uniquely prepared in Washington to deal with these dynamics and ensure that the U.S.-Israel relationship continues to grow stronger. And despite high turnover on Capitol Hill, our new political model gives us the ability to build meaningful political relationships with members quickly and effectively. APAC and local political networks are well underway engaging newly elected members so they come to Washington knowing who we are and what we care about. Finally, our community played an outsized role in this election. By participating in the political process under our name for the first time, we sent a clear message about which candidates are pro-Israel and that we stand by our allies running for Congress. So far, more than 95% of APAC supported candidates won their general election race. And our community, through the political networks, helped bolster the campaigns of pro-Israel leaders. We also saw a number of members with poor voting records who retired or lost to pro-Israel candidates. 
But even as we celebrate the incredible work that has been done by the pros rural community, we know that the 2024 cycle is already gearing up and we cannot wait another two years to take action. We'll be paying close attention to opportunities to support our friends and defeat our detractors. Thanks, Ariel. This year saw a major shift in APAC's approach to political activism. Last December, we announced the creation of a federal PAC and a super PAC to help support pro-Israel candidates and defeat Israel's detractors. The midterms were the first major test of our new model, and the results were a resounding success. For more, we go to APAC PAC director, Marilyn Rosenthal. Washington is changing, and we needed a new political model to adapt and stay effective. So 11 months ago, we launched the APAC PAC and its political portal to reassert our role of defining who in Congress is pro-Israel and to give us a tool to raise significant resources for our friends running for the House and Senate. And thanks to thousands of APAC members, we achieved truly remarkable results that will strengthen our ability to enact bipartisan pro-Israel legislation. And I wanna share just two examples with you. The first took place in Nebraska, Congressman Don Bacon has been an outspoken Republican leader who consistently works across the aisle to advance pro-Israel legislation. Don is in a tough district and ultimately prevailed in his tight general election race. The APAC PAC supported Don and APAC members contributed $200,000 for his campaign through the PAC's portal. And I wanna thank all the APAC supporters. You helped deliver victory tonight, thank you. We were by far his largest contributor and every single dollar was marked as coming through APAC, sending a powerful message to everyone in Washington. The second example takes place in Michigan. We supported a Democratic pro-Israel star, Haley Stevens. She ran against Andy Levin, a candidate backed by J Street, Bernie Sanders, and Rashida Tlaib. And as a result, our community answered the call. By supporting Stevens and not Levin, we sent a clear message as to which candidate is pro-Israel. And then through the PAC's portal, we helped raise more than a million dollars for her campaign. Using all three of our political tools, the Super PAC, APAC PAC, and money raised through the portal, we were able to help give Stevens the support she needed, and she defeated Andy Levin by 20 points. There are many more stories like these. We've only just scratched the surface. In our first year, we supported 365 candidates from every state and virtually every caucus in Congress. And we demonstrated three big and important things as a result. The overwhelming majority of Congress is pro-Israel. We stand with our friends. And perhaps most importantly, we made it clear that being pro-Israel is good policy and good politics. But we are just at the beginning. With your political support, we can continue to secure the future of the U.S.-Israel relationship together. Thanks, Marilyn. We look forward to continuing to work with you in the months to come as we prepare for the 2024 elections. Finally, we turn to Iran. As protests continue across that country, the world is paying increased attention to the regime's response at home and its support of violence abroad. For more, we're joined by Deborah Saxon, APEC's Deputy Director of Policy and Government Affairs. In Iran, we've witnessed an extraordinary uprising against the brutal regime, unlike anything we've seen in recent years. The horrific killing of a teenage girl, Mahsa Amini, who failed to properly cover her hair, sparked heroic protests that are now entering their third month. The government's response has been merciless. Iranian security forces have killed hundreds and arrested as many as 14,000 people, mostly students and young adults. Despite this brutal crackdown, the people of Iran continue their efforts. They're demanding freedom from a repressive regime that has ruled for more than 40 years. Throughout all of this, we've seen Iran turn to its close ally, Vladimir Putin. Most significantly, we see Iran contributing military hardware to Russia for use in Ukraine. 
Hundreds of Iranian drones have already been used to attack Ukrainian civilian targets and infrastructure, often in swarms that can overwhelm air defense systems. In a recent national address, Ukrainian President Zelensky called for increasing sanctions on Iran, saying that if it were not for the Iranian supply of weapons, we would be closer to peace now. As the Iranian regime continues to show its true face, fueling death and destruction against innocent civilians, the White House has said that diplomatic talks to re-enter the Iran nuclear deal are on hold. Now is the time for America to increase pressure and cut off the cash flow to this dangerous regime. That's why we're currently lobbying Congress to pass the Stop Iranian Drones Act, a bill that clarifies U.S. sanctions on arms transfers applies to Iranian drones. This bill already passed the House earlier this year. We hope to see it passed in the Senate soon. This is an important step within a broader strategy to ensure Iran is choked off from the finances fueling its nefarious activities. You can be sure we will continue to advocate for Congress to increase pressure on the regime and show support for the protesters in the months to come.